Please turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. Look at verse 24 through 30, and then drop down to verses 36 to 43. Another lesson that Jesus uh, was teaching to people. Verse 24 says, Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. And the servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Verse 36, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I chose as a title for our thoughts, Looks Can Be Deceiving. That's the emphasis of where we're going today. Jesus teaches us an important lesson about the earthly work of the church in this parable that he taught. In the simplest words, the lesson is that looks can be deceiving. We like to believe that everyone that comes to church loves God, is saved from sin, and is living a holy life, right? We like to believe that. And that certainly is a noble attitude to take and is what we really want to be true about people that come to church with us. But Jesus warns us not to be naive. Not all are what they profess to be. Now, Jesus is not teaching us to be suspicious of people. Instead, he wants us to be objective when we see systematic and consistent inconsistencies between what some people say they believe and how they live. In other words, we are to be aware when some people around the church really are not what they profess to be. To illustrate his lesson, Jesus uses an example of something that was very common at the time, and that was a wheat field. The people were familiar with this kind of farming, which was done by hand in Jesus' time. At the point in the story, the farmer already would have prepared the soil with a plow and a harrow, And then the story begins with the farmer sowing the seed. Wheat fields at that time and in that place were much smaller than the wheat fields we have around us here in southwest Oklahoma. And the farmer did not have a tractor to tow and a planter to scatter the seed in the field. Instead, he carried a sack full of seed, dipped his hand into the sack, and scattered a handful of seed as he walked up and down the field. Brother Larry, when you were planting wheat in Missouri, that's how you did it, right? You just, no, you didn't do it. You had a planter. 
and a drill. Okay, so that made it uh, much easier on you and really more practical in the field. Okay, so things are different then. Well, that's what I just described it was very hard and tiring work. And even doing it on a tractor is hard and tiring work, believe me. Okay, but this is the only way to grow the wheat needed to make the flour. But rather than focusing on the hard work, which the people understood, Jesus concentrated his lesson on what? The seed. The farmer, being a professional, dedicated man, always selected the very best wheat seed he could find to plant in his field. However, there was an enemy that came along after the farmer had sowed the good seed. His intention was to hurt the farmer by ruining his crop and making it unfit to sell. He did this by sowing something called tares into the wheat field. So, what is a tear? Perhaps the modern crop farmers probably know what this plant is. But the average American consumer has no idea and really does not even care. You see, we go to the store and buy our flour and bread, giving no thought whatsoever as to how it got there. Right? Like, you know, you go out there and there's three or four or five different brands of bread. You know, some have red, yellow balloons on them. Some got this cute little girl's face looking at you and stuff like that. You don't stop and think as you look at that loaf, I wonder whose wheat field this came from. I wonder if you had a Ford tractor or a John Deere or an international harvester or a case. Okay, didn't think about that. Didn't think about where he went to buy his seed. What co-op did he go to? We just buy it. Okay, think nothing about it. Well, Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary says that the tear is a poisonous grass resembling wheat but with smaller seeds. And Unger's Bible Dictionary says that these little seeds are black in color. The tear is also known by the name Darnell. And the Encyclopedia Britannica gives us this definition of Darnell. It says, Darnell, noxious weed of the ryegrass genus. Darnell, also known as poison ryegrass or tear, is considered a noxious weed in many areas. The plant is often infected with a poisonous fungus, Neotyphoidium species, in case you wanted to know what that is, that can be dangerous to grazing animals. Albert Barnes, commentants, uh, in his commentary on these verses, writes this. He says, in its growth and form, it has a strong resemblance to genuine wheat, but it either produces no grain or that of very inferior and hurtful kind. It was extremely difficult to separate it from the genuine wheat on the account of its similarity while growing. So while tares are similar in appearance to wheat, Barnes goes on to give us some more information about the tear, quoting from Thompson's work, The Land in the Book. He quotes, the tear abounds all over the East and is a great nuisance to the farmer. It resembles the American cheat, also known as chess, but the head does not droop like cheat, nor does it branch out like oats. The grain also is smaller and is arranged along the upper part of the stalk which stands perfectly erect. The taste is bitter, and when eaten separately, or even when diffused in ordinary bread, causes dizziness and often acts as a violent emetic, and that's something that makes you vomit. Barn fowls, excuse me, barn door fowls also become dizzy from eating it. In short, it is a strong soporific poison. That's something that induces sleep and must be carefully winnowed and picked out of the wheat grain by grain 
before grinding or the flour is not healthy. Tear is not a good plant. So the problem for the farmers that when the plants sprout and start to grow, they are virtually identical. Verse 26 of our lesson gives the first indication of the existence of the tares among the wheat. It says, but when the grain has sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. Okay? The tares had grown with the wheat and so much resembled the wheat that the difference was not seen until the wheat actually began to ripen. The farmer now has a problem. What do I do about the tares? He cannot harvest and sell his wheat crop with tares in it because the poison makes the wheat unfit for consumption. One of his workers made a suggestion to go out to the field and pull up the tares. But in verse 29, the farmer tells them, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Well, by this time, it was becoming obvious which plants were wheat and which were tares. So, Mr. Farmer, why not pull up the tares? You know, we can be careful in doing this. There's an obvious difference right now. Well, the ripening of the wheat clearly showed which was wheat and which was tares. The secret, though, is out. And the deception is now over. But the wise farmer knew why this was not the time to pull up the tares. The problem was something that could not be seen yet. Why? Because it was underground. The problem was with the roots. You see, the Darnell plants tend to wrap their roots around the roots of the wheat plants. And uprooting the Darnell plant would more than likely uproot the wheat plant with it. Jesus describes a real and serious problem that faces his church as it ministers the kingdom of God to the world. Jesus explains that he is the good seed in verse 37, meaning that his personal work of atonement for all human sin is to be proclaimed by his church. In verse 38, he shows us the field is the world, which is the same world that God so loves in John 3:16. So from this we learn that it is the mission of the church to spread the good news of salvation from sin around the whole world until the end of time. He tells us in verse 38 that the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom and the tares are the sons of the wicked ones. Here we see that the gospel attracts different kinds of people. It attracts certainly good seeds, but it also attracts tares. The good seeds are those that are genuinely converted and committed to God and whose lives reflect the holiness of God. The tares, however, are more like the stony ground and throny ground people of the lesson on the four kinds of ground that Jesus taught just before this lesson. For a while, they look like good seeds, but in time, their true nature becomes obvious because of the fruit of their lives is different. It is not the wheat of holiness. It may look religious, but there is the poison of sin, selfishness, and inconsistency that ruins any influence of their lives for the kingdom of God. So here we have a predicament for pastors in our times. Pastors. 
Well, we certainly want people to come to church, and we most certainly want to see people saved from sin. But a fact of reality is that some that start attending church and take on a profession of Christianity do not mature. Some are stony ground, too shallow to sustain spiritual life. Or others are thorny ground in that they are materialistic and cannot put Jesus in first place in their lives. These people are the spiritual tares in that the evidence of their lives does not conform to the holiness produced by the atonement and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the redeemed. In reality, their influence, the influence of the tares, undermines the message of the Gospels and it undermines the testimonies of the good seed, the people that really are living for God. And it is strange, but not unexpected, that the world needs to hear the gospel and see it lived out, but then it sees the tares and overlooks the good seeds. You see, the tares in a congregation are like the poison of the darnel that ruins the wheat. So what are pastors to do? Well, There are those that do nothing because they want to keep all the people in the church they can, right? However, this is self-destructive. Then there are those that will rant and rave at the tares in their sermons, trying to get them out. Ever met a preacher like that? I've seen some. Well, that often results in driving God's people out as well. So what are pastors to do. It just so happens Jesus teaches how to deal with the tares in verses 40 through 42. Now just prior to that in verse 43, Jesus says, the harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. Uh, Your King James Version says the end of the world, but really the end of the age is more appropriate to what Jesus is saying here. Now, most commentators suggest that these last verses in the lesson are to take place at the final judgment at the time. Well, I won't argue with that thought because there will be a final judgment in which the good and bad will be separated for eternity. I agree with that very strongly. However, I like to believe there is a practical application here that is designed to help pastors and congregations to deal with the tares that have sprung up in their congregations. While the statement, the end of the age, certainly signals the end time, it also tells us there is a time of reckoning for every hypocrite in this life. This is a time when God says, okay, I've had enough with you. I am exposing you for what you really are. This is the end of their age of deception. Now, it is not our place to judge anyone. But when God exposes a hypocrite, we can only accept what God has revealed to be the truth. Jesus taught another lesson in Matthew chapter 7. In verses 16 and 20, he said, guess what? You will know them, how? By their fruit. What people demonstrates in their lives shows what they are inside. You can't get away with it. You will know them by their fruit. You see, there is a growing season when people accept the gospel. All people start off as babes in Christ and then grow in maturity that demonstrates the spiritual and moral growth into the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. However, as with natural tares, there comes a time when these tares stop growing while the real wheat continues to grow and get bigger. 
the difference becomes obvious. Jesus says in verse 41, The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom <coughs> all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. Now that word angels is the Greek word angelos, which simply means messengers. And in the church, pastors and teachers are God's messengers ordained to feed the church on the word of God. We are not commanded to attack the hypocrites. However, we are commanded faithfully to teach the word on teach the church on God's word as God gives it to us. As we lift up the truth, God uses that truth in two ways. First, the truth feeds God's people and develops their spirituality. And then second, it will offend and call out those who practice lawlessness. That is, those who do not submit to God's teaching, God's will, and God's leading. Most of the tares will be driven off by continual sound teaching of the Word of God. Those that remain will be dealt with by God in the way He sees is best for the kingdom of God. Matthew Henry shares a comment with us on the tares. He wrote, They are the children of the devil as a wicked one. They do not own his name, yet they bear his image, do his lust, and from him they have their education. He rules over them. He works in them. They are tares in the field of this world. They do no good. They do hurt. Unprofitable in themselves and hurtful to the good seed, both by temptation and persecution. They are weeds in the garden, have the same rain and sunshine and soil with the good plants, but are good for nothing. The tares are among the wheat. Note, God has so ordered it that good and bad should be mixed together in this world, that the good may be exercised, the bad left inexcusable, and a difference made between earth and heaven. In any congregation, you may find three kinds of people. You will find saved people that are actively living for God. These are the good seed. There will be some people who make no profession of salvation. There may be many good people who do make no profession of salvation that regularly or frequently attend a church for whatever reason they do so. Now, these people are not tares. They're just people that really need God. Some do come to God before they die, and some do not. And then there are the tares the hypocrites, and God has his eyes on them. The tares will live deceptive religious lives. So don't be surprised when a tear is exposed. But remember, it is God through his word and the working of the Holy Spirit who will expose the tares when he knows the time is right. So please don't be a tear. Be good seed. Amen.